I don't like those situations a lot of time. I like the ones that you really have to struggle to catch a fish in, which in turn comes to my junk fishing style, the way I like to fish. Anybody got any questions at this point? Because I'm kind of going through this, and you guys are kind of sitting real tight right here. Anybody, everybody good? No, no politics? I'm good. I don't know nothing about them. I stirred up a little bit. I figured I had me some Oregon Duck fans in here somewhere. Anybody here pull for the Ducks? They play the Tide. We're going to crack that butt all the way back. I'm going to tell you. There's some boys in Tuscaloosa right now just rolling up a fatty eating some pork chops and say, we're going to beat them, coach. I had a sports analyst on ESPN and said, Oregon Ducks is the best football team in the nation. To who? Who do you play? I ain't playing nobody. So I don't guess no, I don't watch. Nobody here watch college football? Florida State. Now listen to watch yourself back there. That's going to be a game, whoever said that. Y'all done got y'all quarterback, what y'all done got. Florida State could play for the national championship, couldn't it? I think I'm going to go ahead and say it. I'm an Alabama fan. I predict Auburn to beat Alabama by three points, which ain't going to make me happy. It's going to make my daddy real mad. The doctor had to give him a whole bunch of blood pressure pills. He'd be screaming at the TV. That's what we don't want to do. So if we start to get a little clear about the simplicity, really is. People say, what color jig you fish? A brown one? Any other color? I throw a black when it's muddy. You ever change it up? Yes, yeah, sometimes I throw the black and then I throw the brown. <laughs> when they don't bite the brown, I throw the black. And if they don't bite the black, then I'll go back and throw the brown. I don't need 71 jig colors in the floor of my boat. If he's that smart, he's smarter than me. I promise you, I'm pretty dumb. I need him to bite the brown jig. I fished the open last year at Smith Lake and I drew a guy and I, I grew up fishing on Smith Lake. It's a very tough lake. And the first day I had 15 pounds. Second day I had like 15 pounds. We're in pretty good shape to, you know, have a chance to win. And I drew this guy. He said, what are you going to do tomorrow? Do you mind sharing some insight with me? I said, I'm going to throw a brown jig in brush piles. He said, anything else? I said, I'm going to repeat that same cast with that brown jig in that brush pile. All day, I said, if they don't bite that brown jig over here, I'm going to go over there and throw that brown jig. That's how simple I'm going to keep it. At the end of the day, he goes, buddy, you wasn't kidding about that brown jig, was you? It's a confidence thing. That's what I'm going to do. I don't want to get all confused. I don't want to make 10 casts and say, oh, God, the water's cleared up. That brown jig is too bold. Uh -uh. I know that a brown jig works everywhere I go, and I know the black jig works everywhere. Now, there's some pretty jigs in there. And us as fishermen, we get caught up on it, don't we? I go over there and look at some of them colors. I'm like, God, that's the prettiest crankbait in the world. And I can go dig in every one of y'all's crankbait box, and I can find the one that looks like pure do doo doo and that's the one y'all catch them on every time, right? Ain't got no paint, eyes all knocked out of it, hooks all crowded up. You'd be like, well, that's the one right there. Or was it, it look like one of them $50? Uh -uh. It looks well worn, don't it? Like you drug it behind the truck. So I try not in my mind. I used to run with Marty Stone, and he used to count the strands of the color of the jig, y'all. We'd be in a room together at night, and he'd be over in his bed with his jig box out, and he'd say, this jig right here has got 17 strands of blue. I think that's too much. And I'll be like, really? <laughs> Where are you fishing at? <laughs> he said, man, it's just too bold. I was like, you think so? I mean, but in his mind, he really felt like that was the key. It's really, we really shouldn't bog ourselves down with that. Keep the simplicity of knowing you want to fish around fish. If you're not, not biting, move around a little bit. Yes, electronics helps. You know, I can take my hummingbird stuff, and I can ride around on a lake, and I can find brush pile after brush pile, and I can throw my brown jig in there, and I'll throw a crankbait in there, but I don't get all crazy and do a lot of wild stuff. I mean, I try to keep my time as, as active as I can and productive. When you get to doing stuff, when you're just throwing those, uh, what they call those Boise State Hail Marys, and you guys do that, just start throwing Hail Mary passes all day. I've had tournaments like that, and I've had a classic like that where you don't get a bite in about two days. You'll throw some Hail Marys, but you've got to know at that time that you're going to lose. A lot of times in practice, what I've had to do is learn when you had a chance to win. People think, well, you always got a chance to win. No, you don't. Basic math, you don't. I'll fish 15 tournaments a year, and out of those 15 tournaments, one of those tournaments I can honestly say in my heart I had was on the fish or had a chance to win. Now, I can do some science fiction and say that one that blew up on that pop bar was six pounds, and that one that pulled off on that crankbait was five pounds, and that jig bite I broke off was not. Yeah, I should have won. Those three fish were weighed 28 pounds. That would have put me over the top. Mm -mm. In my heart, I know after practice, I have got a chance to win this tournament. But what I've then learned to do is know when I'm not on those kind of fish, how to fight back inside the top 20. And if you'll watch my career, that's the way the whole thing's been. It's not about, I don't, I don't get the wins, man. I don't. I'll have a practice where I ain't caught crap, nothing. 
not even enough to make a McDonald's fish sandwich, not even a number one meal for $2.99. But come term it down, I'm gonna figure out a way to catch me five. I support a company called Five by Three, no excuses. Anybody ever heard of it? It's five bass by three o'clock, no excuses. If you don't believe that's right, that's how each one of you live. People say, well, I didn't know what five by three meant. It's your lifestyle. On Saturday, you gotta have five by three or you ain't gonna get paid. I got the belt buckle on right there, five by three. That's my life. If I go out on a Saturday morning and I don't know how to catch them, I'm gonna do everything I can to get five bites. If you can't catch five, you can't get to number one. I promise you. You sit around idle, and I've learned to adjust to that when I say, hey, you're not on enough fish to win. And I hear this, and y'all probably heard it a lot too. People get on stage and they'll say, well, Dave, uh, I went out there and swung for the fences and come up a little short. You never got out of the dugout there, dummy. You never got bit. You took yourself out of the game when you got there because you said in your mind, I'm not on them, so I'm just going to throw Hail Mary passes and hope one hooks up. And then when I get on stage, I can say, well, I went for the win and come up a little short. You never got to the plate. I'd at least want to say I bunted one and got a man on first so I could steal second, hope you overthrew it to third and I could get home. Hope is what you need in a tournament a lot of time. Anybody agree with that? Man, got to have a little hope. They said, well, you know about hope. I said, if you live in Alabama in a trailer park, you need hope. Because if a tornado's coming, you better hope it don't get you. Because it's coming. I'm a man that lives off hope. If I can get one bite, I hope myself into getting two bites. I don't need to sit idle and feel sorry for myself because, oh, I'm not on them. And I know Kevin Van Dam or Iconelli's going to catch them. I need to take care of business at hand. I need to go out and keep this right here right. I need to stay open-minded and get my five bites and listen to what the fish say. If I ain't had a bite and I flip by a log and I get a bite on that log, I'm going to look right there and say, okay, that's a log in the sun and four foot of water. And I'm going to keep fishing down the bank. And every time I see one of them, I'm going to focus on that target. And the love of God, don't let another one bite on that jig on four foot of water on that log because I'm going to fish every one in Lake Kissimmee in two hours. I'm looking for a pattern. And when that happens, then all the memories go out the window. It doesn't matter what you've done on the first day of practice, second day of practice, third day of practice. It matters what happens right then. Two bites in a row, that's a pattern. Pack them down, let's go. I need one rod, it's that brown jig in four foot of water. And I'm going to stick with that till I get to five. Once I get to five, I can build off a way to win or try to get myself in position to win. Most of the time, anglers lose on the first day. Never win. There's never been a three-day tournament won on day one. You ever look at the stats? Alton Jones fished one day, caught 700 pounds, won the tournament. Nope, caught them all three days, Jack. You don't catch them on day one, you lose. You have to catch something to get in the game. And a lot of times we have to own up to that. We got to, hey, I'm not, I'm not a guy that's got a lot of pride and say, I don't want to get on stage, so I had to catch them on six-pound line and a spinning rod. If that's what I got to do, I'm going to do it. It's, I mean, it's like riding a moped. I don't want to have to ride it to work, but it's better than walking. I'll throw a spinning rod, catch me a few fish, and get back on my feet. Anybody got a question on that, huh? You ever rode a moped to work? My uncle did. He had like 48 DUIs. I joke around a moped everywhere he went. I can't make that up. My uncle Earl, son, he'd get drunk, ride a moped, wreck. I'd laugh. I was about six years old. It's the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. And you wonder where my sense of humor comes from? My, my granddaddy was like that, and my uncle was like that. So I always have a lot of fun. People say, where's your sense of humor come from? I say, well, my granddaddy was an alcoholic, but he's the funniest man I've ever been around in my life. You got you to gotta look for the positive. Any question, Ruth? See, it's, got, it's something positive in everything. People say you can't find positive in everything. Yes, you can. You really can. It's easier to find the negative. I promise you that. It's easier. You can go to Walmart. You think you're finna check out. Four people cut in front of you. You can look at me and say, what you going to find out positive about that? I'm going to say, well, maybe the girl on aisle seven is cuter. Let's go down there and see. I don't know. Something's positive in there. I don't want to just focus on the negative. I want to figure out why it's better. People say, well, you got a speeding ticket. What you going to find out positive about that? Well, maybe if I didn't get that ticket, I was going to hit that 18-wheeler and die. Pretty good statement. Hard to argue with that kind of logic. I found a positive in it, correct? I'm challenging you to find the positive. And if all else fails, I want you to take a rubber band and put it on your right wrist. I've done this for three weeks when I started my, my whole course with my mind coach. He said, put the rubber band on your right wrist. Every time you all think of something negative, I want you to stretch that rubber band out and pop it one time. Pop your wrist. And in 21 days, you will have retrained your mind that every time you think of something negative, it'll relate to pain. And if you think it don't work, just put your rubber band on when you get home. And I'm telling you, when I first started, I had a bungee cord on there. Because I had some issues. I mean, I'm going to tell you, I had some issues. I was popping that rubber band. My wife be talking to me, like, pow, pow, what is this? I'm just making sure it don't break. This is just that simple. 
rubber band on your right wrist. Every time you think of something negative, 21 days, pop that rubber band, pop that rubber band, pop that rubber band. When you're in a tournament, things ain't going right, you jump off two in a row, pop that rubber band. At least you got them two to bite. I'd rather know what they are biting and lost them as have never got a bite. That's when it's really bad. When you come in from fishing and Dave Marshall leans on you and says, well, Gerald, you got four pounds. You got yourself in a little tight. What you think you're going to do tomorrow? <laughs> I don't know. Apparently, I caught four pounds a day in the middle of Lake Toho. You know, that's what you don't want to be. You don't want to be without any hope. You want to build off that a little bit. So when y'all see us on stage weighing in, y'all have no idea what really just happened that day, do you? I mean, ESPN can't bring that to the forefront, can they? Take me three minutes, I'm going to show you how my world is all jacked up. What you see on TV and what you see on the hunt show looks good, but it's not that good. Let me set the scene. It's Lake Hamilton, Arkansas. you got to make the top 50 to make the Bassmasters Classic. I'm in 51st place. We go to Lake Hamilton, Arkansas. I have got to stay inside the top 50. I've got to catch them. I don't know if y'all have ever been to Lake Hamilton. There's 11 fish in there. Once you catch them, you got to return them back in and catch them again. It's a very, very tough fishery. Very. Day one, I go out and I bag myself 10 pounds. This is a solid catch for this lake. I'm in pretty good shape. I'm in 25th place, which moves me inside the classic cut, and everything's looking good. Day two, well, getting into day two, I go back to the room that night, and that's back before, you know, that's back, well, I've always been kind of a tight butt. I don't really stay in most elaborate places, do y'all? I got a theory that you can't gross me out in a hotel. I've stayed in places where the bathroom tiles stick to my feet when you're in the shower. I don't care. He gonna run me out, son. I'm tough. I get in there with him. I fight roaches all night. I carry a pistol. I'll shoot at one. I've had rats. I've had to draw beads down on, son. I'll stay in some rough places. I'm staying at a place in Hamilton, Arkansas called Pam's Last Resort. Still there today, folks. I'm laying on the bed and my toes can touch the commode. It's that small. It's a little one-room shanty. Good price. Great boat parking. About 300 bucks for the week. Well, I'm sponsored by Sitco at the time, and they took me out to this nice place to eat. I'm a redneck. I was raised on a farm. I eat deer, I eat cow, I eat chickens, and a little vegetables. I don't eat all this foo-foo stuff. Well, after fishing on day one, and I'm starving to death. I went to this foo-foo restaurant, and they start bringing it out. Well, my appetite is taking over, and I'm just shoveling me some stuff down. I have no idea what it is. I'm just filling up on it. Well, I get back to Pam's last resort that night, and I settle down in the bed getting ready for day two because I need to make the classic. And about two in the morning, it started thundering and lightning, son, and I'm not talking about outside. I'm talking about all up in here. I'm talking about a storm was brewing, like one you read about in biblical terms, like Noah's Ark storm. And I mean, it's firing off lightning, and I'm jumping around in there, and I'm thinking, so between two and four, I've completed three whole rolls of toilet paper. I can't get up off the king's throne to get dressed. But in my mind, I have got to make the Bassmasters Classic. It's about a $20,000 bonus in my career at that time just to qualify for the Classic. So I'm trying to mind the gate and watch the cows and get dressed and get in the boat because I'm going to make this Classic. Now I'm telling you, when I've been sick, I've been sick, but that's as sick as I've ever been. I couldn't move. You couldn't close your eyes. Well, I leave that hotel. I psych myself up, run, hook the boat up, jump in the truck, and I'm headed to the boat ramp. There's a Regions Bank in Hamilton, Arkansas that in a flower bed on the left side of the building the maintenance man is probably still confused about what happened. Because I caught myself in a pickle dick. I mean, I had nowhere to go. I'm from a redneck. There's some flowers. I'm here. I'm, there. I'm just there. You know, I ain't got no choice. You know, it's two things that's going to happen and neither one of them need to be right here with me. I'm going to go out here. Well, I get to the boat ramp and when I left the tournament that second day, going into the second day, Trip Weldon told me, he said, you don't have a partner yet. I'll have your partner here in the morning. I pull up and find Trip. As soon as I leave the little blue chicken coop out there on the side of the road, I run down there and find Trip. And I said, Trip, I'm here to get my partner. I'm really sick. He said, her name is Mary. <laughs> I said, good gracious almighty. I'm talking about I got chickens flying around in here and I can't move. And I sit out there in that Triton boat, son, I'm holding that steering wheel for blast off. And y'all ever got that stiff arm where you lock both elbows out? You know, when you eat the Chinese buffet and try to drive home, you done got, oh, good. I'm there in that blast off. They call it like boat 71. Me and that Merker's bouncing down like, coom, coom, coom. Every time, I, oh, oh, go, oh, Lord, something going to break loose. And Miss Mary don't have a clue. She's got her camera. She's been dreaming about this. Her, she said, I've going to fish with you forever. It's going to be the best day. I hear you so funny. Can't wait. And I'm thinking, girl, you have no idea. You have no idea what is going on in my mind. And on the other end of my mind, I am tore up. And I'm catching schooling fish in a pocket. 
And this shit's slick as glass when I pull in this pocket. It's quiet. One of them May mornings, you can hear a rat walking through a field 50 yards away with shoes on, son. It is quiet. There ain't a sound. And she's sitting there with that 35 millimeter camera. She's sitting right behind me waiting for me to catch one. And these fish only school about an hour in the morning and they go down. And once they go down, you can't catch them. I don't care if you're Chris Angel or Houdini. They don't bite. You can leave. You can blow them up. They ain't going to bite. And I know that. When I get up, you know, this thing is rolling. I said, oh, God. So I jump up there and I put that trolling motor down and I'm throwing them fish and schooling and I'm throwing over here and every now and then when that pain hit real bad, you know, you have to walk them off where it gets, I said, oh, Lord, I get like I'm going to change rods a little bit. Oh, whew, I got through that one right there and I'm throwing that bait around. And I just, I mean, I ain't been in this thing 10 minutes and they starting to really come up schooling. And they come up just about one of them 70-yard casts for a gunfish 115. And when I see them start getting up there tromping around on the water, I slip down there and grab that gunfish 115 about 10, 12 inches line out, and I drew that thing back. And I'm talking about, I'm coming now. I'm bringing it, because they way out there. And I get right here, and I'm talking about, I got every muscle in my head. And I said, hmm, son. Let me tell you all a little secret. When you throw that hard, and you relax, <laughs> hello. Son, I let that bait go, and it's sailing like a missile.